evening. In the chaos of late 17th century Britain, <coughs> excuse me, a new religious argument broke out where a group who came to be known as Deists challenged the religion, the monarchy and the government of Britain. It is generally thought that this argument faded out by around 1760 and has no significance for us now. So why is it important? Five reasons. Firstly, deism was the religion of the 18th century, the so-called Enlightenment. The 18th century was a struggle between deistic and Christian intellectuals, and deism was often a cover for atheism in this century. Deism was also the bridge between theism and atheism. Many people crossed this bridge of deism into athe atheism across that 18th century. Secondly, when deism went from Britain into France, it turned into atheism in time for the French Revolution, where the atheists with their guillotines and the terror make ISIS look like beheading amateurs. Deism went into the USA. As has been said, deism was the axis on which religion turned in 18th century America. Half the writers of the Constitution were deists, the first four presidents were deists. The USA was never a Christian nation. At their founding, the separate states may have had a Christian intention, but it was deism that was there pulling the levers when they pulled the states together to form the United States of America. The dollar bill with its symbols of Freemasonry and the Eye of Horus. Uh, deist symbols and they put in this God we trust on the one God that they do trust which is their money. <laughs> Deism went into Germany from England and it provided the intellectual, the philosophical and the methodological foundations of German biblical criticism which broke the nexus, the tie between Western academic theology and Christian the theism. This is what has destroyed the Western mainline Christian denominations over the last 200 years, which is the subject of at least two other talks, but not tonight. <coughs> and finally, theism was there at the origin and the making of the modern world and modern apologetics, which William Lane Craig has made a point about. But in talking about modern apologetics, there is one aspect which is left out. <coughs> the early church fathers could say that people listened to and took notice of Christians because they can see how we love each other in spite of our differences. In present day terms, they would say, we have the high ceremonialists with their saints and feast days over there, the charismatics over here, the young earth creationists in one corner, the old earth creationists in another corner, Hillsong here, Latin Gregorian chant over there, and we all love each other and look after each other like Jesus told us to do as his disciples. So we Christians set a pattern of love, care and peace for the whole world. However, by 1700, with this deist debate, the Christian apologists were having to say, you should believe in Jesus Christ in spite of the way in which we Christians behave after 200 years of religious wars and bitter argument. And an example of this is Thomas Aikenhead. 1696 in Scotland, at the launch of the deist, public aspect of the deist debate, Aikenhead was found guilty of blasphemy. He had pre appealed to the Privy Council they upheld the verdict but said that it could be remitted if the Church of Scotland agreed to do so. Well, the Christianly loving, caring Presbyterian Church of Scotland General Assembly urged vigorous execution to curb the abounding impiety and profanity in this land. One Presbyterian leader said that 
Aikenhead's writings were a complete aggregate of all the blasphemies that ever were vented, maintained or excogitated by all the atheistical ministers of Satan in all ages. That Aikenhead surpasses the most malevolent of all the devils in everything except knowledge. So the next day, 8th of January 1697, Thomas Aikenhead was taken out and hanged. Thomas Aikenhead was a first offending teenager. This is what the deists were against. <coughs> because of all this religious violence, several vile deists insisted that all that was needed was to love God and love your neighbour because that's what Jesus said. And you Christians squabble over everything else so it can't be significant. We now also have the public problem of child abuse. So what is modern apologetics? What's diff different about it compared with past apologetics? There is no appeal to religious experience in a sense of the Holy Spirit or anything else because John Locke's Epicurean materialist ep epistemology had ruled out any appeal to inner religious experience. Only what comes through the public material senses can form knowledge. There was no appeal to Christianity's ability to transform lives because the institutional Western church of all denominations seemed to have forgotten about this in their bitter squabbles. No appeal to Christian works and history. Well, I've explained that one. So modern apologetics has come down to academic arguments over the Bible and science and comparative religion. And the framework of all these arguments was set by the deists. So what is deism? This set of beliefs was laid out in 1624 by Lord Edward Herbert of Cherbury, the founder of deism, that a God made the universe in a one-off event. God is hands-off ever since. There is no revelation outside nature, thus no scriptures. No miracles, no prayer, no personal relationship with God and no priests. They hated priests. So they said all religions are equal at zero. In other words, this is a naturalised general and universal providence only. No special providence. God, they said, has to be equally understandable by all and that is only through studying the creation. In other words, science and the laws of nature which are equally available to all people in all places and all times, not to a select chosen few. That would be discrimination by the Creator. This was nothing less than a full-scale assault on the foundations of Christian belief, and hence a full-scale assault on the foundations of European culture. Deism was the religion of the 18th century, which, as I said, was a struggle between deist and Christian intellectuals. Now, this system is all very neat, clear and simple, but wrong. Very few of these stirrers were actually deists. Tolland was a pantheist. He even invented the word to describe himself. Collins and a few others were atheists. Some were Gnostics. Some were theosophists, latitudinarians, which is a muddly, floppy sort of Anglicanism. Some were political liberals and radicals, and some were unknown. Occasional ones were deists. So why are they all lumped together under this one title? Firstly, it was because as deism that this group influenced the whole of the 18th century. Deism was sold as a religion of reason, which required neither priest nor revelation, only reason and science to understand God in creation. And secondly, thank you, they were united in what they opposed and in what they proposed. They were united for an attack on Christian or any other religious power political, judicial, social, institutional power, and they absolutely hated priests and ministers. After 1688, the political model of Britain was like this. God is at the top and is ruling over everything. The government has taken control now. They have appointed the king, and they have now changed the rules so that the king has to be the religion of the people, not the other way around. The government also had control of the church in a system called Erastianism and they ruled, that ruled the people. 
The deist were against this middle level interlocking of king, government and church, controlling everybody and everything and what they're allowed to do or say. Why did they, what did they stand for in wanting to break this model of government? They stood for freedom of religion, toleration within the system. Locke had proposed this and written works on toleration for everybody except Roman Catholics and atheists. You couldn't trust Roman Catholics because they owed allegiance to a foreign power and you couldn't trust atheists because Plato said so. They wanted freedom of speech. They also wanted freedom of the press in a secular republic. And this bunch of deists, known as deists, are not given enough, any much credit for how important they are in the history of the rise of the modern world, the modern Western world. So what were their weapons in their attack against all of this? Their first weapon was reason. And like the so-called Enlightenment, the deists never defined reason, even though it was their flag, their guide and their weapon. Somehow nature was always in perfect accord with reason and natural law is inviolable, an item of blind faith. By reason, what they meant was reasoning within a naturalistic paradigm. They were assuming what they needed to prove of naturalism, which was their blind faith system. Their naturalism provided them with an a priori rejection of anything and everything that they didn't like. They took reasoning as being the only faculty that we have that is in the image of their God and claimed that this is all that God requires of us to use our reason in all things, ignoring the obvious huge range of reasoning ability and conclusions that humans actually come to. They claimed that deism is the rational core of all religious belief and cut out anything else that they didn't like. But there's no obvious consensus amongst the deists as to the content of this so-called rational religion. To explain why not everyone arrives at the same conclusion as them over the previous thousands of years, the deists claim that people are confused by a conspiracy of prejudice and priestcraft against reason, so that only some, their own special selves, learn gradually to overcome this conspiracy. Their other big weapon was ridicule, a polished potent weapon in their hands. The deists claimed rationality, but instead of serious argumentation, they built most of their case against miracles and other things by ridicule. Collins found biblical precedent for ridicule in Elijah's ridiculing the prophets of Baal. As Redwood said, the age of reason could perhaps more eloquently and adequately be called the age of ridicule, for it was ridicule, not reason, that endangered the church. They ridiculed miracles and prophecy and healings. Ridicule enjoyed a widespread appeal that academic argument and serious exegesis simply could not do. It's the same as television shows now. Thinking makes bad television. A detailed, structured explanation of anything makes terrible television. It's got to be a verbal boxing match for entertainment. So what were the deist works? I'll give you the four most notable authors. 1696, Tolland came out with Christianity Not Mysterious. He was an Irishman. This debate is often called the English debate. Deism was invented by a Welshman, launched in the public debate by an Irishman and closed off by a Scot. So I call it the British deist debate. This work launched the great public debate. And this work by Tolland was burned by the public hangman in Ireland where Tolland lived on the orders of Parliament. And Tolland went off to Europe. And in Germany, he had a great influence on the teenager Caroline, who became the wife of George II of England. She became an, a religious radical. and spread deism through the aristocratic and royal families of Europe. 
she had great connection with Tolland, Voltaire and other radicals in England. Day is, uh, Caroline greatly influenced her close relative who became Frederick the Great, who converted the German university system from pietism to deism, which is why South Australia has a wonderful wine industry. The German Lutherans who came here brought from the pietist wing that lost this debate with Frederick the Great's conversion of the university system in Germany. Paid for to come out here by the Baptists. Collins, 1713, Discourse of Free Thinking. Um, George Barclay wrote a length, lengthy and carefully reasoned refutation that we'll come to later, Al Cifferon. Collins wrote many other works and was involved in a significant written debate with Samuel Clarke on Can Matter Think? Collins was pushing the fact that matter can think and in the process of this argument, Collins invented the concept of emergent properties, but the terminology for it wasn't invented until the 19th century when John Stuart Mill put the label on it. But Collins invented this back in 1709. Wollstone wrote over three years six discourses on the miracles of our Saviour. And uh, there was a, quite a deal of reply to that. And then Tyndall, 1730, came out with Christianity as old as creation and both sides of the debate called this work the Bible of deism. I've, got, I've been around this deism subject for 15 years and I've got some of the books there to show you and Tolland and Tyndall are there on the table. That's the only work that Tyndall ever wrote and it produced well over a hundred replies. The best of the orthodox responses were from Bishop Thomas Sherlock, 1725, The Use and Intent of Prophecy, 1729, I'll come to these two works later on, the 1729, The Trial of the Witnesses to the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. Bishop George Barclay came out with Al Cifferon, or the Minute Philosopher, in response to Collins' work. William Law, now I thought I'd known most about who the deists were, and a week ago I found an article by an interesting academic who said that William Law's The Case of Reason, which I hadn't heard of, is amongst the most astute apologies for Christianity ever penned. So I'm going to have to get hold of it. And Bishop Joseph Butler, 1736, The Analogy of Religion, which remains a classic of religious philosophy. Read it if you dare. It is difficult, dense, abstruse. And at the end of three readings of a paragraph, you're sometimes not quite sure what point he's making. All four of these were Anglicans, three were bishops. The Roman Catholics and the dissenters didn't seem to rise to great heights in this debate, although they did make a few contributions. All the points that I will present from here on in the dais debate, with their assaults on Christianity, were more than adequately answered in their time, as most as all of the historians detail. But I won't bother you with that. I'll just focus on what the deist said so that you understand the attack on Christianity which created the modern world in which you live and have to deal with. They attacked scripture repeatedly, continuously. They attacked the concept of scripture and revelation. The deists didn't believe that there had been any revelation from God to humans. They said that all claimed scriptural, sacral scriptures were human inventions and could be analysed and attacked as such where it didn't agree with their own beliefs. They said that the Bible is exclusive and restricted to a small population in one time and one place on the globe. They claimed that God had communicated truth to all people equally by means of reason alone. Quite ignoring the huge range of this so-called reason which doesn't allow God an equal communication to all people. And it's still restricted by birth and upbringing as much as anything else. They attacked the text of scripture. They argued that a book that came from God would be expected to be more exact and better written than the Bible is. The deist said that claimed written revelation depends on the uncertain meaning of words and that it is subject to the uncertainties of transmission 
with inevitable, inevitable textual corruptions. The deists argued that the Bible is a confusing and divisive document, as illustrated by the continuing fractures over the readings of Scripture. The Reformers thought that they were making the Bible the cohering basis of all their beliefs, when they'd actually made the Bible into the battleground of Protestantism. Deists maintained that the Old Testament is textually badly corrupted, and in response to this set of accusations, a young Richard Bentley developed the modern system of comparing families of manuscripts across centuries so that you can work out, rather than causing confusion, you can work out more accurately what the original text was. And that's the standard system ever since. The Deus said that the Bible was not historical because the Chinese had records that went back much further than the biblical record. They attacked the canon of scripture. They capitalised on the different interpretations and different canons of scripture amongst the different sects or branches of Christianity. The Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholic and the Protestants all have different canons. So they said, eh, this is just set up by priests who create their own power systems, make their own choice of books and then declare that this is divinely inspired. And they critique books which had been included and excluded from the canon. They attacked the persons in scripture. They challenged the integrity of the prophets. The patriarchs and David came in for criticism of persons of dubious character, confusing piety and morality. In Christ criticizing the New Testament sto miracle story, some deists maintained that Jesus was not even a good man. They criticized the content of scripture, miracle stories in particular, which we'll come to later on. They channel, channel, challenged many Old Testament stories and they attacked doctrines out of Scripture, in particular the fall and original sin because they were at the beginning of developing the, the doctrine of human progress which took over the 19th century and so they didn't want paradise back there from which we had degenerated. They want paradise up ahead which we can make if we plan and work for it properly. So that's why they rejected those two doctrines. They were rabidly anti-priestcraft. They urged that everyone had had a natural religion but it had been corrupted way back at the beginning of each civilization by priests who wanted power over the people and that priestcraft is just self-serving mystification. Now this attack on priests and ministers worked very well because everyone in England was anti-clerical in some form or other after all the religious wars. And they're all saying, yes, our priests and our ministers are fine, but you can see that all those other people's priests and ministers have corrupted them. So there's bit, a bit with everybody. And there was open mocking of the clerics, the priests. Religions are politic law devised by the prigs of the schools to keep the rabble in awe and amuse poor bigoted fools. They attacked church history, as I've mentioned. They dwelt on charges of pious fraud and the gullibility of early Christians. Well, how gullible are they if they put their lives on the line? Some deists rejected all miracle stories after the apostles, as did many pro Protestants. They said that religious wars were due to the distortions for power by priests. And they attacked any idea of mystery. Nothing was allowed to be above reason. Nothing in religion was allowed to be mysterious. Everything had to be plain and clear to the educated middle-class male British mind, which could contemplate the whole of creation. What cannot be understood cannot be known to be true. But these deists accepted science as their control system of explanation even though science is riddled with mysteries, apart from being an uncompletable project, which in its entirety is already way beyond the comprehension of any single human mind. There are mysteries in science. How come anything exists? What is energy? What are laws of nature? What's the initial cause of everything? What's the ultimate explanation of everything? Beauty, truth, meaning, value and purpose don't fit very well in scientists' views. And they attacked prophecy. <coughs> 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 
They claimed that prophecy was made to look true only by metaphorical and allegorical interpretations, not by naturalistic historical evidence. In other words, they said that the interpretations of prophecies had been fiddled to make them appear to have come true. Deists denied that the Old Testament prophecies were literal and so could not be used as a supernatural confirmation of Christianity. To do this, Collins adapted and enlarged the allegorical methods and interpretations of origin of Alexandria back around 200. The deists quoted Celsus and Porphyry's ex accusations that the early Christians so interpreted the Hebrew scripture as they wanted and needed to make it appear as though the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament. They cast doubt on the actions of Jesus and the apostles by suggesting that they were merely following pagan practices in claiming the fulfilment of prophecy. Two major defences against this was Samuel Clarke in his 1704 Boyle lectures where he aligned the Old Testament and New Testament texts to show that prophecies had come true and Bishop Sherlock back again with his The Use and Intent of Prophecy and although the deists made lots of mention of Sherlock's work, they never replied to the core of Sherlock's thesis. And they attacked miracles. The rejection of miracles and the denigration of testimony is the core of their argument. This is where theism and deism, or where theism and atheism or naturalism confront each other pointedly. The deists isolated and ridiculed individual miracle stories, ridiculed it, reinterpreted it, allegorised everything. They attacked Balaam's ass, Samson's locks of hair, made the rest of the miracle stories look so silly that any defence feels like quibbling. They re ridiculed Jesus' killing of the fig tree out of season and his driving someone else's pigs off the cliff. William Lane Craig said, in some cases, the strategy was to make the biblical miracles look so silly that no amount of scholarly reasoning could generate belief in them. The deist pointed to miracles in other re religions and also to false miracles, which appeared to be as well attested as any claimed real ones. The attack on miracles came early in the deist debate. 1683, Blount. Blount, by the way, is one of the few people in this whole sit up system who were actually deists. And he is almost the only disciple of Lord Edward Herbert who founded deism. 1683, he wrote, Miracles, no violations of the laws of nature, which drew heavily on Hobbes and Spinoza. In 1693, he produced his Oracles of Reason in which he collected Hobbes's statements favouring deist notions and he translated Spinoza's chapter which gave a naturalistic explanation of miracles. And in this process, Blount provided the connection between Spinoza and German critical liberal theology. The Bible's supernatural accounts were constantly under assault by the end of the 17th century and ridicule was emerging as a favourite tactic of the sceptics. Annette, for instance, A-W-N-E-T. Miraculous conception, talking about the virgin birth of Jesus. In short, a child was begotten in a miraculous, stupendous and astonishing manner. Or in other words, that a child was begotten in an unnatural and irrational way and consequently repugnant to the established laws of nature. To Tolland, no event can be considered less certain and thus less rational than a miracle. This attitude is the basis of the so-called quest for the historical Jesus, where the definition of historical is history interpreted within a naturalistic paradigm. So no miracles are allowed in the story in any way. In particular, Deist rejected the resurrection of Jesus, as William Lane Craig has detailed in his PhD thesis. I've got it over there for you to look at. I won't go into the immense details 
of these debates. With 700 pages there, just on the historical arguments for the resurrection of Jesus, William Lane Craig has over 1,300 footnotes. A massive debate. I'll simply summarise the core of three particular arguments by the deists against miracles. Their theology against miracles was to say that God is the perfect watch clockmaker of the universe, therefore God does not interfere with miracles. And God does not interfere with miracles, therefore God is the perfect clockmaker. Voltaire is the classic presentation of this circular argument. And circular arguments are nothing rare in philosophy at all. They go round and round in circles. There's in Gilberton, there's a street sign which has the name and the sign under it, which I've wanted to photograph and stick up in the philosophy department because the top sign says, Ponder Avenue, no through road. <laughs> The problem with this idea is where did they get their idea of what God is like? A revelation? They differed widely in their own beliefs, so they weren't working with a very stable base. And secondly, where did they get the idea that the whole of creation, of what the whole of creation is about, to the point of controlling God in his actions on his own creation? How did they know that the universe is nothing but a perfect clockwork machine? They used science against miracles. The laws of nature are immutable, unchangeable, therefore miracles never happen. Miracles never happen, therefore the laws of nature are immutable. You plough through these hundreds of pages of everything and the argument boiled down to these circular core arguments. The problem is that the laws of nature are complete mystery. The laws of nature are nothing but mental abstractions from observed regularities. What makes everything behave in such a way that we can abstract these laws? We have not a clue. So this raises an interesting question for then and for you for today's apologetics. What would it take to falsify naturalism? Bear in mind that if you attack the naturalist framework within which science is interpreted, then you'll be taken, even by some philosophers, as attacking science itself. 1741, Chubb, in his Discourse on Miracles, argued against the logical possibility of proving miracles and against their being used as reasonable proof of Christianity. So testimony was attacked and it's equally circular. Witnesses are only believable when reporting natural events because reports of miraculous events are unbelievable. Reports of miraculous events are unbelievable because witnesses are only believable when reporting natural events. We need faith to believe the testimony of another person and if they testify something that is beyond our experience then we have trouble accepting their credibility. And one of their claims was that testimony cannot be credible which relates incredible things. So Deist dismissed all of the primary documentary evidence for Christian miracles by their arguments against the credibility of testimony. And this is the centrepiece of William Lane Craig's thesis the historical arguments for the resurrection of Jesus in the deist controversy. What if you experience a miracle? They used this argument against it as well. Even the experience of a miracle would not convince a rational person, they claimed, as William Wollstone wrote, reason about the laws of nature trumped sensory experience. Even though it was sensory experience that was used to define the laws of nature. The deists magnified the process of biblical criticism and it was more strategic and rhetorical than scholarly. This list is of 17th century people who in various ways prepared the ground for biblical criticism. Raleigh, Herbert, Descartes, Hobbes, La Peyrea, Jean Mabillon, Spinoza, Richard Simon, Newton and Locke. If it's of interest, in 1655 La Peyrea's pre-Adamite book concluded that Adam was not the first man. Nothing new in the arguments in the world at all. Charles Blount stirred the pot publicly beginning in 1678. 
He translated Spinoza in 1689, as I said, which gave naturalistic accounts of miracles and provided the connection between Spinoza to the deists in German biblical criticism. When deism travelled from Britain into Germany, one of its first strong supporters was the playwright Lessing, who published works by other deists and wrote his own deist play, Nathan the Wise. In his writing on deism and the new critical liberal theology, Lessing invented what has become known as Lessing's Gap, his claimed gap between the facts of history and religion. You can't make a religion out of the facts of history. Theologians seem not to have noticed that Lessing's deism is built into this gap. When he said that, the contingent facts of history cannot be made the basis of a religion. And all of his deism is loaded into that word contingent which the theologians seem not to have noticed. Theists don't think that all the facts of history are contingent, that they're just happenstance. So this so-called gap is repeated, built into the repeated quest for the historical Jesus, that uh, there's a critical naturalistic historical liberal theology and there are quests for the naturalistic historical Jesus. And they keep leaving out the word naturalistic in all of this, which is their defining underlying belief system of deism or atheism. So on one side, you have the Jesus of naturalistic history, and on the other side, the Christ of theistic faith. And those words in brackets keep being left out. But that tells you the philosophical positions of the arguments involved. I took to philosophy because of one of my heroes of biological science, Jacques Monod, who deserved his Nobel Prize for his part in the Jacob Monod hypothesis on the translation of DNA information into subcellular materials. I thought that Monod's chance and necessity was wonderful. So I read it a second time and thought, oops, there's a couple of problems here. So I read it again and again and again and realised that when Monod lifted his eyes from his microscope, he was hopeless at philosophy and logic, as are many other scientists famous in our day. What I've since learned with some theological studies and such is that theologians are just as hopeless at philosophy and logic as scientists. So if you get caught up in all of this theological mess, may I recommend a book to you, Humphrey Palmer. The Logic of Gospel Criticism, London Macmillan, 1968. Humphrey Palmer at that time was reader in logic at the University of Wales. He's now the Emeritus Professor of Logic. <coughs> Being as bad as scientists in philosophy at, at philosophy and logic, theologians have no idea of the demolition job that Palmer has done on textual, documentary, source and form criticism on the New Testament. It's available on Amazon.com. Deism was the bridge between theism and atheism in the 18th century, and it was mostly a one-way traffic across the bridge into atheism. The conversion of Anthony Flew to a deist position six years ago shows that it is possible to reverse the flow across this bridge. Deism died out for a while in England, but deism's greatest influence on the Western church was when it went into Germany and became the philosophical basis of critical, naturalistic, historical, liberal theology. As I said, it broke the nexus, the connection between Western academic theology and Christian theism. From there, we've had the destruction of the Western church over the last 200 years, whereby the mainline denominations have become sideline denominations, and the weight of Christianity has shifted out of Europe to Africa, Asia, South America. I'll leave you with a couple of questions. What would it take to falsify naturalism, bearing in mind that attacks on naturalism are taken as attacks on science, even by some philosophers? And secondly, with all these wars of religion and child abuse in the West, is the Christian brand too damaged to recover in the West? Now, I've been around the subject of deism for 15 years, so I have some books here that you might like to look at. Um, this one is William Lane Craig's thesis. When he came here to that talk in the South Parklands a couple of years ago, 
he signed it for me and he said, oh, I've never signed one of these before. He said, they're rare and expensive. So I kept my mouth shut and I didn't say, I bought it cheap secondhand on Amazon.com. <laughs> Tollins, Christianity Not Mysterious, Matthew Tyndall. These are photostat reproductions. There's a company called Garland which got itself going in New York in the 70s by printing British philosophers and theologians of the 17th and 18th centuries. And it's a huge listing of all of these works on both sides. Butler I mentioned as one of the worst Christian philosophers going. And this is interesting because this is an edition of that terribly dense, abstruse, abstract work which has been edited by the Right Honourable W.E. Gladstone, Prime Minister of England. We haven't had a Prime Minister in the world in my lifetime who's capable of such a thing. This is the oldest book in my collection, so be gentle with it, it's broken. 1732 this was published and it is one of the original deist works. Um, when you look at this, you look at the tremendously complicated printing with Hebrew and Greek and other languages and the point of this to look at is that if you're a radical in those days and you wanted to push radical ideas you got into the printing industry and several of several some of the printing houses were deliberately set up for doing that sort of work. Deism is still an option in America and here's the current deist work so that's what I am from America. Thank you. First one is, uh, how do we do the, the second one first? Um, is a Christian brain too damaged to recover in the West? Because if you, if, if you actually look at um, uh, census studies and see demographics of people who are Christian or other religion or secular, the uh, Christianity has declined as a demographic for those who actually identify themselves as Christian and the secular is rising even though there's a still a uh, preponderance of a lot of people who still are not really religious so it seems to be a trend it seems to be common in virtually all Western nations is it inevitable or is, is it possible for this to be turned around so what do you think? Yes. Yeah, but Marnie has to look at the history of the church and just see mm -hmm. that it's gone down many times. I think of the Restoration under um, is it King Charles, mm -hmm. um, I think that's the truth. Uh, he came back and uh, you know the debauchery that went on in court um, and falling away, and then of course uh, I mean, maybe this is only the UK experience. I'm sure there are others. Well, I'm partly on ignorant. What is the Restoration? Can you just give us after a after the Puritans came with Oliver Cromwell? Mm -hmm. uh, Remember, I think it was James. Who, who lost his head? Was it Charles? Charles. Charles, 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 Charles lost his head. Charles the one. That's right. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the Puritans came in with Oliver Cromwell, and, and, and they had what's the right word? A parliament, but a fairly uh, doctrinal, um, enforced Puritanism on the rest of the. Uh, but when Cromwell died and so on, I'm sure there are other stories that you can explain better than I, when the Restoration came, a lot of the uh, libertarian delights, you know, with the libertarian, uh, the, the release, something people threw off all restraints and, and went all bold because the king himself came back and held court and, and let all that happen within the court itself. So yeah. there was a lot of release. Uh, and I know by the time, I think it was the early 1700s, and you can understand here, every fourth dwelling place, every fourth structure in London was a, uh, a, a hotel or pub or, or serving grog. And the, the whole debauchery you know, drinking was in excess in London. And that was the time when the Wesleys and the Whitfields emerged. Now, please, I stand corrected. Does anyone else know the history of UK? But my point being that we've seen that we've seen the same, we've seen the church damaged um, by you know the over prescriptive purity. You know, people got tired of it and they threw it off. But then there was a revival again. Right. Think, so you're saying it is not Yeah, know, I'm saying history teaches that the church does decline, religion is thrown off, um, but it can be restored. Mm. 
in, in that <laughs> time? I don't know the history either, but would, the, would people have called themselves Christians even, you know, regardless of their behaviour? I'm just thinking the church, the Christian brand, but rather than actually being actively Christian, is perhaps what's going down rather uh, than... The, I think uh, there's a lot of suicide. People, yeah. I mean, most of, when Wesley, etc., had to preach, they weren't allowed into the church to preach, they had to go and go... Yeah, so and that's, that's, because they, the that's because the Christian leaders opposed them. Yeah, they did. They were still called people, Christians, not, though. Many of the, sorry, many of the poor people were gathered towards them. Yeah. But it wasn't. We're not, the, in, we're not in the, not dark in the future. It, wasn't, it wasn't the people stopped saying they were Christians. They may have not been behaving as you would expect a Christian to behave. Yes. Now we have a large number of people who will no, no longer say they are Christians. I think you're right. That's the, that's that's, that's, that's what's different to that time. Hit a point mm. there, yeah. Is there any difference of people who don't say they're Christians or people who say they are but don't practice anyway? Christianity is not actually in the census. You can't say you're a Christian. You have to be brave. There's a Baptist or something. Yeah, yes, uh, you can be Muslim, you can be all the other things, uh, branches. There's a spot for other people. Yeah. Yes. I think it is the nature of history that uh, it has been punctuated through uh, by revival time and time again. And where authentic Christianity has broken out, it has transformed society turned a society which people despair of ever being godly, uh, such as the 1904 revival in the valleys of Wales, south, southern South Wales, and that has been the pattern of the Holy Spirit, uh, not only of course in the last 2,000 years, but also of course through Old Testament times, I mean things didn't look too good uh, in, in Israel and Palestine a number of times, uh, beyond the pale there, uh, and then they're rudely interrupted by God's Holy Spirit in one form or another. It is the, the pattern and the theological undergirding of it is, of course, uh, Lord, why does the, it continue? And, and why don't you wrap it up? And the theological answer, of course, is from Scripture, is, is, is because God wants uh, as many as possible to come into his kingdom. So whilst, whilst God doesn't give up on the West, I don't think we should. And we can also say that the Christian brand, so-called, if it is purely a human construct, then it will die, and what's the point anyway? But if it's more than a human construct, if God is in it, then... The arguments in this point are saying that child abuse problems there, these big systems like the Roman Catholic Church don't reform from inside. This is... Erasmus was the last chance for the Roman Catholic Church to reform from inside when that didn't work, God sent in the sledgehammer, the rather brutal one, as Erasmus called him. Um, but it's, it's been worse in the past. In 1800, um, in St Paul's Cathedral in London, the second biggest church in Christendom, on Easter Sunday, at the only service on Easter Sunday, there were six people. And in 2000, when we were in Westminster Abbey for Easter Sunday, <coughs> in this age of loss of faith and everything, there were 600 of us in our wing of the Abbey. So it, it has come and gone, but... The Anglican Church is in pretty steep, going up right now in the UK. Um, in a lot of city centres it's happening <coughs> first, but it's happening right around. There's a growth in the Anglican Church right now. But I'll tell you a, a, a revival story that's fairly recent. 1959, Billy Graham came to Adelaide, and you know what he was able to do, fill football arenas for thousands of people. He was about the MCG. Simple gospel out. He did that in Adelaide. My father got converted by it, actually. Um, and it had a big influence on me when I was very young. Um, I was nine. Um, but a Baptist minister many years later told me that he almost expected revival to break out in 1959 in Adelaide. He had several incidents of what happened. One day he was in his uh, church, in the office, preparing his Sunday sermon, as he was usually doing on Black Friday. 
and he got a knock on his office door. And he doesn't get too many people come visit him at that time. He opened the door and there was a truck driver there. This guy had been driving down South Road <coughs> and he just felt compelled to park his truck and go and find someone at the church. And he walked up and down South Road until he saw this Baptist church that was quite a long way off the road up the street. But he saw it from a distance and he went straight to it, knocked on the door and he said, I need to get right with God. And a little bit later, same week, another truck driver walked in the same way. And there were stories in 1959 of God being at work like that. Nobody was doing it, only God was doing it. These people just plucked out of their life and changed. Hmm. Um, with um, this question, like, um, is, is a brain too damaged? recovering the will, Wes, like, um, in my involvement in politics, I scratch my head and think quite often, uh, what's the role of apologetics? Is it to actually reach the non-Christian world or to repair the church? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, like, what do you think? <laughs> is, our, is our ministry really uh, to the church or to non-Christians? I, I was trying to have it go to non-Christians, mm -hmm. but I'm not so sure. I don't know, that was the line through the area of bits I was putting in here that we've got to clean up the church first. And we've got to be nice to each other for a change. I mean, surely that's and that When I grew up in the 50s and 60s in the bush, uh, and social historians have commented that country towns were wonderful, unified communities. The only time they were ever divided was on Sunday morning when they all went to their separate denominations and threw rocks at each other. It's in my lifetime. I have a contrast to that one too. Um, we had a Chinese girl from uh, Beijing uh, join our church. Sorry, not Beijing, the other big place. What's her name? Shanghai. 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 She's been to Beijing lots of time. I talked to her about it, that's why it confused me. Um, she got converted about a year ago now, today, a year ago. Um, she was planning to come to Australia to study. She came here. She came to our church about four or six weeks after she arrived in Australia looking for a good church. The Christians she knew back in China were saying to her on the internet that she needed to find a good Christian church in Adelaide and get herself in there. She said, you'll have a second family, there'll be people who love you and support you and help you all the way. And she came with that expectation to our church and it happened just like that. Um, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that there are people getting converted easily and simply in the world today and apologetics is very effective for those people. Um, this girl and her fiancé, now husband, uh, two young Christians, very delightful people, um, and they have a testimony that's so fresh and new of their faith that it makes these old churches join um, sit and think again about things they haven't thought about for a long time. Uh, it's really good. Um, is there anybody else who'd actually like to make a, a comment on that question before we move on? I mean, this, there's a lot of negative stuff around the damage to the brain, but that's surely as it's repairing, as it's acknowledging, as it's working on it. You know, you need to dig out the rock to get to heal. I see it as part of the process of healing rather than ripping it to shreds, jumping on it. You know what I mean? Does that make any sense? Um, a lot of the one of the big things uh, that's wrong why the Christian band is, band is being damaged is because of the uh, sexual abuse things that happened, uh, and a lot of the worst stuff happens decades earlier when the brand was actually doing better. And so we've kind of reaped what we've sown there, but the fact that we're, we're repenting of it now is where, yeah, the brand is bad now, but it's only going to be better um, because, because things have come to life. So it's, it's the things that we do or don't do now that's, that's going to partly determine what, what any Christian brand looks like in the future. 
The other thing that rises to my mind is that uh, is it inevitable that there will be problems within the church? Like Jesus told the parable about the tears of the wheat. So uh, uh, if you want to kind of reform the church, is there a sense in which that's possible and what you see is what you should expect? The testimony of history has been one of God continually calling his people to faithfulness. It's, it's a cyclical thing, isn't it? And you don't have <coughs> much of a theologian to pick out the characteristics of what happens in revival and renewal. These are classically the denominational labels fall away, the accidents and incidences of history, that there is unity that, has, that is quite shocking. Uh, there's a, a renewed love of scripture, there's a renewed love for outreach and what have you. The symptoms of that have not changed, I don't think ever. And so whilst there is a God of grace, who is persisting in his call to his people, there is hope. I think that the church in the West is in a particularly bad spot. It is not good news. Any statistic will tell you that it is bad news. Uh, certainly in Australia, once called the most godless place on earth. And I think we actually have to acknowledge that the persistent culture in the media is atheistic or deistic. Uh, you know who the bad guy is in a film or because it's the, it's, it's the one with the dog collar. Uh, and that's just, that's, and that is a cultural norm. And uh, we're sowing that culture very consistently now and therefore we're going to be reaping that as the next generation reach adulthood. So it actually we are in a very difficult position and we actually do need to reform. And there has to be renewal. If there is hope in, for the next generation in Australia, I think we have got huge cause to worry. I think that the Christian brand, if by brand you mean brand names of denomination, are too damaged to recover. I think they should die. And I shall dance from the grave. There, there is something called Christianity which has a bit to do with being like Christ. And that's what the Holy Spirit returns us to. And I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm liking the consistent things that the Holy Spirit does and want to be part of it. I think there's a slow movement of what you're talking about that is happening. Um, in America, it's a little bit more obvious than here, I think. The Baptist denomination, very slowly and very surely, has become a bigger and bigger and more powerful denomination in that country. And I think the reason is that they have worked out their own governments better. And uh, I've, I've been interested to study this sort of thing way through history. When Constantine became a Christian and sort of organised Christianity as part of his political plan for the Roman Empire, <coughs> He did something very bad for the church. He took over a lot of pagan temples and he turned them into Christian churches. He, as the state, set up the clergy for this new church. He told them to wear these special gowns and stuff to distinguish themselves. He told them to set up liturgies and, and uh, uh, rites and ceremonies, uh, more like the pagan temples that they replaced. Uh, he took away from the ordinary people the power that they had and invested in a clergy and a state-run institution. And that has continued and is still going powerfully today in various forms in all over the world. And it's the worst of our denominationalism we still see sitting. But in the, at the end of the Enlightenment, in Britain first, but around different places in Europe as well, there was another kind of church. They had all sorts of names. The Anabaptists were people who would baptise you again if you went to their church. It meant baptise again. Then there were other Baptists who weren't as strict as that. But these people were the non-conformists, the ones who didn't believe in bishops, they didn't believe in the right of kings. 
They didn't believe in countering to a government in matters of faith and religion, and they did believe in organising and ruling themselves. And they learned how the ordinary people should learn to do that. Who knows the book of Robert's Rules? Anyone know what Robert's yeah. Rules is? What is it? It's a book of how to run a meeting yep. according to democratic principles. Well, or not quite democratic, but it's, it, there's a philosophy there of how to run a meeting by ordinary grassroots people, isn't it? It's not having a clergy or a special class of people do the leading. It's that ordinary grassroots people learn to rule themselves. The guy Roberts was a, an army. I'm so sorry, but where's this heading? Because we were talking about these. Yeah, quickly. Um, the Baptist Church has had to learn how to run itself from the grassroots because it didn't believe in a strict clergy and it believed in the separation of church and state and all that sort of stuff. And this Roberts guy was asked to run a Baptist church meeting and he thought that would be easy. And he had a dickens of a time doing it. He did a pathetic job. But he became so interested in his failure, he wrote a book on how it should be done. And his family still controls that book. They brought out the 11th edition last year. And it's used all around the world in clubs and in governments and in parliaments and in Lawmaking. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure where it yeah. is going. And it's that's the thing that's happening in some denominations now that is a positive sign of a better governance. And the church hasn't actually learned to govern itself properly yet. Okay. Uh, with this other question here, what would it take to falsify nat uh, naturalism? Attacks on naturalism attacks, attacks on society. Would you actually kind of want us to address that question? I think that's the fundamental problem of modern apologetics to the outside world, isn't it? With a materialist, naturalist, scientistic outlook. Sorry, you can explain yourself. And further, I, I would love your answer, Len, yeah. because I, I'm pretty sure you've got a bit of an answer to that, and I would love to hear it. No, I haven't done much on it. I only thought of the question yesterday. <laughs> uh, because I was wading through some of these debates. This is really what <coughs> Bishop Sherlock was up to with the trial of the witnesses for the resurrection of Jesus. What evidence would it take to prove that this is what happened? Um, and the deists had a shot at his book was very popular and went through multiple editions and was very popular for decades afterwards. <coughs> but in our present materialist secular world, I'm not sure what people would see as an answer to that. What would you mean by, by uh, naturalism? Are you talking about like the philosophy yes, yes. or are you talking about the actual real physical world around us to no, prove that that's false? The philosophy of naturalism, that there is nothing but nature. There's no supernatural. Mm -hmm. right. <coughs> what would it take to, to uh, falsify the idea that there is no supernatural? So I'm not okay. really sure about the idea of falsification, but the um, thing that strikes me is that you know, in moving from, say, describing the physical world in terms of, um, you know, things hitting each other and, you know, this sort of Newtonian mechanics, that sort of view, but if you try and explain life in that way, like living organisms, you can't do it. It's, you have to have this account of where an or what an organism wants to do, what wants to grow and live and reproduce itself. So you have to bring this other element in, and as Nick was saying earlier, about understanding the human condition and what, what works for us as, as people that makes meaningful in our lives. You can't get that from naturalism. So it's what's the best explanation for making sense of human life, I guess. I, I think some people would challenge that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and like, uh, you know, all the evolutionary theory, uh, uh, so they've got a, a physical explanation. You're trying to disprove something, isn't it? <coughs> yeah, that's it. 
the, the, the basic a, a scientific hypothesis needs to be falsified. Uh, to be a scientific hypothesis, something needs to be falsifiable. You need to be able to say, I think this, but if it's something else, then we'll, we'll observe something that's inconsistent. And if you can't actually falsify something in that sense, then science is interested in it because there's, um, uh, the, the, there's no experiments you can do one way or another. So basically, basically a, so the philosophical assumptions that you make aren't falsifiable because that's where you start from. They're your presuppositions. So I think uh, yeah. most of the proofs that seem to be there are the circular arguments that you were showing before. So you're saying that we should actually put the question to the naturalist, yeah. what would it take to falsify your Yeah, because if not, then, then what's your basis for, uh, for believing it? Yeah. Because, because like, uh, to me, uh, there yeah. are kinds of standards. If you come mm -hmm. with some scientific evidence that seems to point to God, like the beginning of the universe, yeah or the fine yeah. tuning or anything like that, there's a, a few standard replies. Like one of them is, we currently don't know, but one day we'll find out. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, um, you can say that to anything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the teapots flying that's around so. planets uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the famous philosopher once quoted. Yeah, right. Exactly right. Um, one of the biggest problems with naturalism is it's an absolutist claim, isn't it? That's, mm. that's the thing. And uh, as such, it lacks humility, and it's making a, a firm claim in the absence of all knowledge, which is what you'd need. And, uh, and so I think the first thing you can do is to invite people to a degree of humility, uh, to a, an agnostic position which is more creative. And then you can have a look at the natural world and how unnatural it is that it exists. And, and uh, naturalism works very well in, in the bounds where you let it run in, in science and biology and what have you. Uh, it, it runs into huge difficulties in some of those other areas that you have mentioned at the bottom. But I think the very first one is, as I say, and I shut up now, is just simply that it's an absolute claim. And, and because it ab that is absolute, uh, it is immodest, uh, ignorant, uh, and that's a fair place to start. But immodest doesn't mean false. No, no, it doesn't <laughs> quite right. It is immodest. It, yeah. it, but you need to know all but I, information. I, I would say you can't falsify it because it's your basic assumption. And if you interpret everything in terms of that assumption, there's no way you can argue against it. Equally, if I assume that God is a creator of all things and, and, and lives in my bedroom, you can't prove it against me. I think individuals may decide naturalism is false if they see miracles or see something that doesn't fit. Mm. But um, yeah, I remember uh, someone I met when I was at school this one year who said, I will believe in God if he brings me a keg. <laughs> and, and I or one of my team members said, well, he's, he's, he's brought you a, a drink and, and some pancakes and, and, and a sausage. Isn't that good enough? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this is only a part of society because we've got a very mixed society since the 60s New Age Revolution because one part of society is all naturalist theory, no supernatural. There's another, another side that are all <coughs> spiritual but not religious. Um, so this question is only at one section of current Australian society. As I've said once before, the whole concept of what is an explanation has changed. Well, it changed across my medical lifetime because by 1700, the concept of explanation was materialist, reductionist, and that was the world I was brought up in in the 50s and 60s in medical school and when I started out and when patients asked what's caused, what's, why has this happened, they would accept the scientific explanation from the medical world. But by the end of my time, of all the strokes that knocked me up, this had all changed. And if somebody said, why has this happened? I'd have to try and quietly find out what that person's belief system was. And there were very few people who would accept the scientific explanation, the scientific medical explanation, as being it. Some people would fit it as part of their belief system, along with their crystals and karma and everything else that they have, and other people would just dismiss it altogether. What was the 
was your field of medicine? Uh, general practice, country medicine, emergency yeah. medicine. Um, so and I'm doing something beyond the the naturalism. I'm looking for something beyond naturalism to explain. Well, there's a whole lot of new age spirituality, and, and quite a lot of people will say I'm spiritual but not religious. Mm. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means, but it is, it is quite a modern <coughs> society now. To me, uh, to, to be unkind about that, it's with the new age movement. It, it's almost that they're living their lives based on fairy land and and how wonderful everything is. Crystals and then when they the crystals and whatever they believe it. And, and uh, then when they get hit something like death, cancer, that's something, something which is real, they can't face reality because they've lived their life in dream time. That's my un, un, uh, un, un, uh, sympathetic view. But that's how it is. Sometimes I was tempted to ask, but I never quite asked it, well, if that's what you believe, why have you come to me? Absolutely. Uh, we can move on to the rest of some of the other things that uh, Leonard talked about in his talk. You actually mentioned about apologetics appealing to science and reason and ignoring things like religious experience and things like that. That's because of your friend Locke. Would you put uh, William Lane Craig in that category? But, um, but just to go on to it, if, if you um, say, all right, it's wrong for apologetics to rely on reason and evidence and, and not appeal to, say, the more miraculous uh, aspects of the Christian experience, like, how do you know whether it's true? Mm. What, what's the sensible way to go? The sensible approach to miracles. <laughs> well, the problem with reading William Lane Craig's thesis, which is really the only part of him I've studied, is that when I was talking to him and signing that book, he was talking to Mark Worthing, who'd had the same supervisor, um, Pallenberg, for one of his PhDs. And they were saying that, yes, there were all sorts of things that Pallenberg would say, you can't say that, you can't say that, you can't say that. So I couldn't say that in my thesis. But now that he's given me my PhD, I can say it. <laughs> so what I've studied there is what he was allowed to say by Pallenberg. Yeah. So I don't know what he actually thought himself on some of these things. He didn't enlighten us on what these other points were that he could then speak freely about after he got his PhD. Um, I, can, I might be able to enlighten you on that. Um, William Elaine Craig received a question that I um, uh, how shall I respond when I hear speakers that confuse me and, and throw all sorts of doubts uh, in my mind? And his re response is uh, 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 a distinction between knowing and showing. He said the role of uh, apologetics to use reason and argument is uh, to show that there's good evidence for Christianity, but it's not the same as knowing. That he actually said we actually know through the witness of the Spirit. And so he says, all right, you come across questions that bother you at the moment, you should, that doesn't mean you should chuck it away because um, as a Christian, you should actually have the wisdom of the Spirit by which you know it's true and so you can hold the other thing in suspense. I think whether it, whether, whether what he's saying go or, or not, the point is he does have that other angle mm -hmm. of Christian experience and he's not just being uh, solely intellectual about it. We need to go one step further there too. It's not, it's not just between me and the Spirit that I'll know. Yeah. It's also involves the whole body yeah. of Christ. Sometimes you'll have a person in the body of Christ saying, I experienced wonderful things and God spoke to me this way through it. And I'm sitting there going, no, I don't think God would say that. <laughs> and I'm sceptical. And I've got to go to that person and say, look, you need to be sceptical too. You need to put that experience before the body of Christ and see what the community says about it because there might be some aspects of what you experienced there that are not seen correctly and the, the community sees the danger in that some man to say therefore God is saying such and such out of it he might not have been saying such and such out of it and you've got to submit yourself to the discipline of the whole body in working through the final detail yeah. so, you, so you're saying that uh, all right, it's not just a personal experience, uh, personal experience of the spirit it's also a corporate thing. Yeah. 
But anyway, and, and you're comfortable with uh, addressing the question, like uh, if, if it's not just solely intellect and evidence, what is the uh, basis or authority by which we actually have certainty? Mm. If you don't know, say you don't know, maybe it's another skin no, answer. Sure. Okay. I'm still that. thinking about it. <laughs> um, my upbringing was somewhat different from all this in the city. I grew up on a Baptist Aboriginal bush mission, and I was involved in the Stolen Generation and trial and all sorts of other bits like that. Um, and what I saw there of Aboriginal tribal life, witchcraft, tribal wars, and seeing the transformation of lives is a huge experience that stays with me, but I don't see in the city, and I want to go push it in, please. Mm. And the worst thing about heaven is that it's told that, that it's a big city. <laughs> I don't want to go to a city. Even if this paint we've got, I want to go bush. Out under the stars. I think that's lovely. I think this is just testimony of what happens when, when authentic Christianity hits the community, and that that in itself uh, it points to its veracity. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the Apostle Paul was faced with the same situation. The situation in his day and today is not so different. And he operated, I'm thinking on my feet here, but I think he operated on three levels. First of all, he, he, he thought it was reasonable for people to look at the order of creation and suspect that there might be a God and to seriously investigate that. And you were culpable if you did not, in Romans chapter 1. Mm -hmm. um, you are without excuse. You should at least have asked the question. So that was the first thing. That, 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 that um, nature itself, the mere miracle of existence that things are, should point you to the possibility of God. And so he was an apologist in, in that regard. Secondly, uh, he, he said, look, I am now going to tell you about what happened, uh, which has been historically attested concerning the person of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And he expected that to transform people. And then he had another position, which was the life of the community, in which were two things. One, uh, the extraordinary transformed behaviour, and secondly, the garnish of miracles. It wasn't normative, but the fact was the Holy Spirit was messing with that group of people. And so those three levels seem to me to suggest themselves to us today. How much of the first point has survived Hume's critique of natural theology? Because that was actually aimed at demolishing the deist arguments for a natural theology for their God. I was using it in the sense of the judgment that no one would be able to come to the judgment before God and say, I'm not culpable. Um, I didn't see all these things that some people have seen. And God is going to answer them and say, if you saw the creation, you are culpable. Yes, but yeah, in an yeah. apologetic sense, what, is, what ways are there around Hume's demolition of that argument? In his dialogues concerning that You want to talk to that? That was published post war. I, I just wanted to make sure that I, I understand what you think the demolition was and, and, and what aspect. So can you just. Give us a thumbnail sketch of his demolition, and then we'll be here. How did you demolish the design? What he was saying <laughs> is that you are chip. not just extrapolating, you are expanding when you say from this to God, and you're expanding beyond the evidence that you have, which is not much and can be read in various ways. Well, I struggle with that. I'll tell you, I'll just finish that if I may. And, um, The opposite of God is, is reasonlessness. Probably a better word. Chaos. 
Um, there is no evidence that exists to suggest that significant reduction in entropy can be caused um, without in energy and intelligence. There, there, there is no evidence. Uh, uh, to go back to Paley's clock, which had been thoroughly mangled by Chucky uh, Darwin, um, you know, it doesn't make itself. And therefore, there is a sense in which a little bit of Paley's logic still stands uh, undemolished. And that is that where there, where there is order, at a, at a fundamental level, as opposed to the, the opposite being nothing, nothing, where there is, that the best explanation for something being is that there's been mind and intelligence. There's, there's, there is no other law to, to, to draw something from nothing. That's not a bad argument as a starting point. So it's, uh, even though um, Hume has actually presented an argument, doesn't mean we have to accept it, does it? So, so Paul's actually saying that um, by your own intuition, it is actually correct to make that inference um, from observing creation and that pointing to a creation. Yes, I'm slightly nervous of intuition, but I think, I think you know, as an, an empiricist, you can actually say, what other mechanisms will result in decreased entropy? Mm. Uh, there is nothing other right. than The Christian oh. philosophers are still struggling with overcoming <coughs> Hume's arguments against natural theology. Yeah, they always will. It's a fake statement in the end. I, I sort of not into the academic side of it. To me, just as a human being looking at the world, what, what makes us think that we're living in a world of order? To, to me, the, the universe is chaos. Even, even on Earth, you get, you get people knocked over by trains, buses, volcanoes come up. You can't fly from Bali to Australia anymore because of all that sort of thing. The whole thing is chaotic. But, but Our bodies are dying. You're, you're only reacting to that because normally you can fly to Bali. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, universe, the universe is sufficiently ordered for us to fly to Bali. Just occasionally things go wrong. Yeah, so, so that, there's to, quite a lot of order in among all that chaos. I, I, guess. I, I disagree. <laughs> I, <don't> think <laughs> I think that we, we, our minds are just look at it that way. But there, there is, it's chaos. Chaos. Even in your, your own internal organs, it's chaotic. Uh, like with evolution, uh, your, your body changes to fit in with the environment, but your internal organs, that's why they have to draw sketches of the internal organs on a nice diagram because in reality it's a mess and because it's a mess because it has to nature does through natural selection does a uh, twigging of things trying to make things a little bit longer if the legs are gone longer we've got to get, try to get the blood vessels going it's and these things sort of process. Well, i'm not saying there's absolutely no order but it, it's come out of chaos but primarily it's chaotic I think it's interesting when you're talking about things start off in the best possible state and they degenerate over time, and we are part way through their process. I'd like to say, that as Christians, we don't have a strong answer to that question. It's a good question, um, but we do have a. We are not without an answer. There is an answer, um, and it usually goes in the form that uh, you know this life isn't the ultimate. We're in a life of separation from God and punishment for the fall. And we have a hope of a better life that's going to be restored and continue after this one. And if we learn our lessons out of this one and go into that new one, it's going to be wonderful. Yeah, but the, the point was that we were saying, Paul was saying, that everything's nicely in order and everything like that. Therefore, there must be a God. And I'm, I'm suggesting... <laughs> More than suggesting, I'm saying that it's not, that's wrong. It, the thing is chaotic. It's a little bit like uh, that song, you know, uh, all things bright and beautiful, all things great and small. Like that yeah. <laughs> but what, what, what about uh, uh, bacteria? What about uh, things, oh, I've forgotten, uh, well, they, they, they feed off living animals. Yeah, things like right this, true. tigers and, and things. I think in the last part of this song, I'm not going to sing that song, but I don't like singing that song about the world we live in. 
even, well, even well, just to help you, if I may, um, Paul the Apostle, who wrote in Romans um, 1, that the order should cause us to uh, investigate the possibility of God, also wrote Romans 8, where he speaks about all of nature groaning as uh, a woman in childbirth, uh, because it has been corrupted, uh, that nature itself has been corrupted. And therefore, we have uh, the fact that there is order uh, because of God, and disorder, it is busted because it is imperfect. Yeah. And the two need to be held in tension. What, one of the things it's probably important and helpful to say is that there's a difference between things operating to a divine blueprint and things being ordered. Things can be ordered without there being a blueprint. To me, that's saying uh, everything's ordered, like he was saying, and therefore God's running the whole show. Uh, however, where there is a little bit of disorder, then that's because we've sinned and because uh, God's punishing us and we were separated from him. And that brings in some another factor, this sort of supernatural knowledge that we've got. If you look at the, the universe as it is, I don't think there's one of us here would not say that is predominantly chaotic. Can I make a little comment on that point? About, about the medical. One of the things that intrigued me about prediction of cardiac troubles, heart troubles, was that there is not a natural slight chaos to the heart rhythm and a warning sign of very quickly upcoming heart trouble is when the heart rhythm locks on an absolutely regular beat. So in the irregularity there is, is built in as a normal part of life. All right. I don't know what to make of it, but no, I, no. you just reminded me of that mm. fact that when it, once it locks into a, a rigid beat, in it's still chaotic you're in trouble. Yeah. Mm. yeah, especially with zero. Mm. But um, <laughs> uh, is there uh, other, other people who would actually like to raise a point or ask a question about what Leonard presented? I wanted to go back to one of the questions, actually. The um, um, And I think there's a thread going through what I've been reacting with some of the things that are said. The, I think that the brand of Christianity is not what we're meant to be focusing on. Um, that there's something beyond that. Yes. And one of the dangers we've got is that we've got these rigid ideas about what the Christian brand ought to look like. If you look at revival all the way through history, whether it's you know, the Wesleyan revival or, or what happened <coughs> in 1904 or what happened in Moon Tour or everything, everywhere else that, that you've got revival, it often comes from unexpected places. Um, and it's possible that revival of the Christian brand, however you want to call it in the West, is not going to come from the expected places. Um, it's interesting that there are now people being sent from Africa as missionaries to the Western world. At the moment they're working with immigrants, but how long will it be before they actually start working cross-culturally? Um, it's and the the other point I'd make, like to make up with is when if you look at revival, revival never started by a church trying to put its house in order. It always started through an encounter with the Holy Spirit, mostly through prayer. If and then the order came. So the order of revival was always prayer, revival, and then the transformation of the church. It never occurred by transformation of the church, then revival, then an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Never. Our brand will recover when we become more spiritually attuned to God. Because we will, that will transform us anyway. Yeah. But um, don't we have annual men's conventions and all that sort of thing where that message is, comes out repeatedly? Uh, and, but in a sense, uh, nothing happens. It's because of men. Yes, but you, if you look, take a longer view of history, things do happen. They often don't happen <laughs> planned, but they happen. And they're usually unexpected. They that come out of areas that you're... I mean, they come out of areas you're not expecting a recovery there. The, heavens, the mood to revival happened because of a, a funeral. 
I think that's not really. I'm it. sure they weren't planning things to happen at the funeral. This sounds like chaotic to me. Oh, uh, it's very chaotic. <laughs> but that's that's the spirit working. He normally operates in ways that we're not expecting. The revival that happened in Borneo not that long ago, I can't give a year to it, but it's 15 or 20 years ago, maybe, um, started when a group of 12 year old boys held a prayer meeting at a school. Yep. And it changed that nation. Yep. Uh, it wasn't one of the most vigorous revivals on the world. You know, it, it went so far and then it fizzled again. But those little boys made a big issue of confessing your sin and getting right with God. Yep. And they went to the ministers in their church and their leaders in their church and said, you guys have got to confess your sin in public and get yourself <coughs> right with God and get yourself right with the people in the church. And that's how the revival started and that's how it continued. Mm. And that's often how revival mm. happens. I, I don't need to be a wet blanket if I read the old discourse, Matthew 24, there's going to get a time kind of time when actually things do go from bad to worse and they don't recover. And so that's the time when Jesus comes back. So I'm not saying, I'm, my own view is revival may not be inevitable. But Jesus said it is not inevitable. It's going to get go from bad to worse. At least at some time. At some stage, yes. Mm. We talk about revival as, as new people are coming to faith and learning about it. I think that will always happen. <coughs> but the world is going to get worse to live in the idea. Yeah, no, the love of many will grow cold. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the many out there. The, the no, no, the Christian church will grow cold. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people in the church who don't know what being a Christian is. That's true as well. All right, anybody else like to ask a question or um, make a comment? I suppose I still would like um, Len, to go back to the question that I raised with Leonard during the break. Uh, trying to sort of defend deism. You know, we're aware in the contemporary world that compared to our communities, in many Islamic communities, uh, there's still a very great enmeshment between the state and the church. And most of us think that that has quite problematic consequences. I was defending deism because it was seen to be the vehicle that, in our history that led to us living in this quite liberal, pluralistic, tolerant society that we have now. Most of us, I think, are happy with that, aren't we? That we are tolerant about various divergent religious views, that the state is not enmeshed with the church. Um, surely you'll admit, Leonard, that deism was a factor in producing that outcome? Well, everything that humans do has a good and a bad side to it. And it's just a matter of how you balance it up and how you value things. Um, I don't know any purely good things that humans have done without any bad element to them. Uh, I think we've managed a few evils with not much good attached. But I think it's a bit too simplistic to just <coughs> see the good day as it done tonight. There are Christians have done a lot of good to have, have, have done a lot of good as well. Um, it was very keen Christians who wanted to see the Jews in the UK have freedom of religion. And they meant it from the bottom of their hearts that everyone should have freedom of religion. And it wasn't the deists who wanted that, it was the Christians who wanted it. But it was also the Christians who expelled them from Britain. Yeah, so different, 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 different group of Christians. <laughs> 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 Anybody else? 
got something to, to comment or ask? Not directly to do with this, but um, when Leonard was saying about growing up in the bush and others were saying about the chaos all around them, we don't live in town anymore, thankfully, and every morning and every evening with the most amazing sunsets throughout the year this afternoon, there was just beautiful clouds, beautiful rainbows. We see that every day. You go there, you can't not just be overwhelmed with God. You know, you, it's just, you're here with mankind, aren't we wonderful? We make things and we're in the buildings and we're reading stuff and we're being, we need to understand everything. But if you just get away from what we make and go out in God's world, the chaos isn't there, it's order, it's, you know, it, just walk outside sometimes and just breathe and be, feel it. Don't try and understand it. You try and understand it. You can't understand it. It's God. You know, he keeps saying, you're not going to understand me. All this, you know, that um, the West is losing God because they need to understand everything rather than accepting the mystery, which, you know, us, anyway, getting off track. You know, our, our missionaries coming from countries where there's more than reasonable faith. There's unreasonable faith. There's acceptance that I'm not going to understand it. She things happen. God will hold me. She things keep happening. I'm being held by God through it. Not he has to make it better. What the hell's going on? What you know? What the heck's going on?